I'm just doing an extra recording just for safety's sake, just in case <laughs> we have an issue. Um, okay, so uh, today we're talking about race, digital technology, and social media, and I'm going to go a little bit quickly so that we get through um, as much of a lecture as possible. These are the items that I want to discuss with you today. Firstly, briefly, a little bit of a theory around race and the digital. So what does it mean to think about race in this age that we now call the digital age? Then some research on racism in the tech industry. Then thinking about some of those myths about the internet and the idea that the internet is beyond race, is, in a, post, is a post-racial environment, and the ways in which hopes for that have really been dashed by the realities of just the amount of racism that we find on the internet. Briefly, I'll mention the digital divide. I'll explain what that is. And then think about how racism is replicated in the spaces of the internet, looking at some research from American political scientist Charlton McElwain and uh, digital theorist uh, Sophia Noble on algorithms of oppression. Then I want to think about the rise of what's being called cyber racism on the internet, but especially I'm going to focus on how the extreme right has used the internet and social media specifically in order to spread race hate, particularly in the current age, I think um, it's becoming very apparent. And lastly, thinking about from the other side, how anti-racists have harnessed the internet and social media in order to challenge racism. So as I say, quite a few topics and we're already quarter past, so we'll see how much of it I actually managed to get through. Okay, so internet and digital technology, technology studies are starting to look at how the digital world changes our understandings of race and the experience of racism. Research into race, digital technology, and the internet stresses that the digital, that digital environment in which we all live today both changes our understandings of race and creates new types of racial inequality in ways that could not be foreseen before uh, the start of the digital era. Studies mainly emphasize the ways in which digital technologies produce and reproduce racial representations. So for example, some of the research that's most uh, known is, for example, Lisa Nakamura's research. She uses visual cultures methodologies to theorize the digitizing of race with particular reference to the experiences of Asian Americans. Other people look at racializing practices in particular online communities, such as gaming communities, where in fact there's a huge amount of racism. And a lot of attention has been given um, to the idea that contrary to expectations, the internet has not made everybody equal. So there's this notion that the internet would flatten out differences between people, that everybody could be equal on the internet, and in fact people have found that that isn't uh, the case. Now race itself as an idea has been described as a set of programmed codes that lend, uh, lend themselves particularly to being digitized. So you think about race as a code or a set of different codes or ideas about how we classify people. Then you can see there's a kind of a parallel between those ideas and ideas about digital technologies. So ideas about race and racial differences can be thought about as coded in to digital technologies of various kinds. So things, as I've mentioned before, games, but also online dating apps. So think about how you can you know, literally select for racial preference in those apps, but also sh shopping websites, and as we'll see later, facial recognition software. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on. <clears throat> So the instigator of the at yes you're racist uh, Twitter handle, which the image on the front side was from, created this account during the 2008 presidential election in the US um, for the following reason. He said, this is a quote from him, I created the Twitter account yes you're at yes you're racist to disabuse people of the myth of a post-racial society one tweet at a time. So literally this person trolls through Twitter 
finds racism and tweets at the person who's tweeted something racist, yes, you're racist. So quote tweets and replies in this way. So he tries to cut through and also represent to show just how much racist discourse there is on social media. So in order to understand a little bit of the background to why we have so much race, racial ideas and racism reproduced in internet spaces of various kinds, it's useful first to take a little step back and look at some research carried out by Jesse Daniels, who's probably one of the most um, significant sociologists of the digital uh, working today. She's done a number of studies both on the far right uh, online, but also on digital sociology more broadly, and she's looked specifically at racism in the tech industry itself. So what she says is that the internet itself reproduces racial hierarchies and racialized tropes or stereotypes about different racial groups. And these are reproduced both in the hardware that drives uh, technology and in the software um, and, for example, in what's called the graphic user interface, so literally what you see when you navigate a website. So what is represented there? So things like, uh, in the hardware, master-slave commands, um, the white cursor or the white hand, okay, which we don't think about, but you know, is by default white, and you could ask why, and the ways in which white people are depicted very often as default, right? So you'll have... Um, this notion, and in media in general, that white people in Western cultures are the default, and this is what we often see represented. The tech industry touts itself as diverse, uh, so very much in terms of the way it, it, it uh, represents itself in advertising and so on, but is in fact predominantly white and male, while the majority of the production of the actual hardware, as we know, is done by poor and black people, including outsourcing to the global south. So the ways as a way your phones are produced and so on will often be in you know, Chinese factories, for example. Um, obviously, there are various stereotypes about people who work in the tech industry. So you'll have a connection between South Asian people, Indian people in particular, and particular forms of labor in the tech industry. Now, she says that colorblind fantasies continue to define mainstream ideas about the internet in terms of access as well as use. The internet was heralded as a colorblind space where there are no frontiers of race, gender, class, and sexuality. And in her paper, she mentions this early advertisement for the internet. Um, it's from the late 80s, I think, or early 90s, which kind of makes this point. I'm just going to play it. People can communicate mind to mind. mind. There is no There is no There are 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 no Okay, so you kind of get this idea of the utopianism, but I think you'll, you'll, you know, until the, those ideas are still relatively prevalent today. Accessing and using the internet also is seen as race blind. In other words, anybody can make themselves what they want to be on the internet. So, for example, Jesse Daniels mentions that tech entrepreneurs say that all it takes is to make money and to be famous on the internet is to start blogging. So, if you start blogging, uh, you, you, anybody can be famous, and you can see that with people who are influencers and say Instagram and things like that, so taken to the kind of nth degree, but obviously this is also determined um, uh, by race. She says that only 1% of entrepreneurs who get venture capital to start a startup company on the internet are black. This is in the US. So this calls into question the idea of this new digital era heralding a level playing field or greater equality. She also says in terms of who studies the internet, so in this field that's become known as theorizing the web, almost no work is done on race. And I can testify to this. I actually went to the theorizing the web conference that's held in New York 
every year. I went to it about three years ago. And there was one panel on race issues um, in the entire conference. And considering how much racism there is on the internet, I found that relatively surprising. Now, another person who's done a lot of work on this idea of the internet being a digital utopia or a post-racial space is Lisa Nakamura. And she's one of the first theorists of racism and the internet. So she's seen how the internet has evolved over time and the ways in which racial ideas have been reproduced within it. A few themes in her work include the idea of racial passing. So this is the idea that you could be anybody online uh, and you could you know, decide to, be, to take on an avatar of a black woman if you were a white man or whatever it is. And this was actually presented at first as purportedly being good for society and it underpinned a lot of the ideas about the internet having this post-racial capacity. So literally the idea of being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes was seen as a means of overcoming racism. There was a lot of what you call digital utopianism. This is the idea that the internet would be a truly post-racial or post-sexist space, as Jesse Daniels also uh, says. Now, she says that new media in general appeals to us because it gives us the impression that we can construct our lives from a wide range of available possibilities. However, this utopian view doesn't consider how increasingly, in fact, there is no division between the online world and the offline world. So before, people used to talk about the virtual and the real, but now we live so much in the digital and it's so much Fact, you know, factored into our daily lives, and so many things are done via the internet and smartphones that actually it's very difficult to talk about uh, a separation between um, these two worlds. So the internet and digital technology reflects but also intensifies real life. Digital enabled passing, so passing as somebody who you are not, creates an illusion of diversity where it doesn't actually exist, Lisa Nakamura argues. She says there's a kind of a fetish of interactivity, this idea of the world being at your fingertips, you know, that you can just, a few mouse clicks and you're transported to another reality. And this lends itself to the idea that role play on the internet and so on can allow users to create their own fluid identities. Now, of course, this completely refutes the possibility for race both to be reproduced, but also to actually exist online, right? So there are racial div divisions within online spaces, not just uh, in the so-called real world. So Nakamura has critiqued the idea of online identity tourism, as she calls it, which she says allows users to wear race interchangeably and to unwear it without feeling racist. But those who engaged in these practices, she says, also didn't want to hear about racist experiences that users had, both in, for example, gaming settings. She talks a lot about video games online where you play with other people in various settings, yeah? But also didn't want to think about how perhaps their behavior within games and fantasy spaces like Second Life and things like that that I don't think anybody does anymore, but she was, as I say, one of the first people involved in this kind of stuff, they didn't want to talk about how they themselves may have been reproducing racism. I'm going to skip over the video of her talking about this because I don't have time, but I, I will put it on um, online later on. Okay, so briefly, oh, sorry. Briefly, I want to talk about something that's called the digital divide. Again, looking at Jesse Daniels' work, she talks about the digital divide rhetoric as setting up a binary or a division between so-called sophisticated whites and undereducated, undermotivated, and underemployed minorities. And she says that this is a disabling rhetoric and inheres in the definition of the digital divide, which further embeds a broader division in Western culture between literate and illiterate. So think about, in general, how we tend to talk about people in the Global South, or indeed, when we speak about Aboriginal communities, particularly in remote and rural areas, we talk about them as having deficits or lacks. And when it comes to the internet, 
and a access to the internet, but also ability to use it, we also talk about people as having a lack or an insufficiency. This is said to be caused by race, but in fact disables the ability to see race in the broader social context. So race in itself, in this context, is sort of made natural, as if it's natural for people of certain racial backgrounds to be unable to access and use the internet. Nakamura's research on the digital divide deconstructs the notion that Asians and Asian Americans, for example, are what's often called the most wired group by failing to include non-English speakers in the sample. Asians are characterized as so-called honorary whites in a way that obscures the actual oppression and their position as the material labor base in the tech industry rather than merely as another consumer group. So all of the various divisions within both the tech industry and the way in which the internet is used are kind of played down, again, in this discourse about the haves and the haves not, have nots, those who can access and those who can't. So in this schema, Nakamura says, white people and whiteness in general are the norm, while Asians and blacks are seen as the anomaly, um, as either shut out of the internet so blacks and Latinos in this case, this is in the US context where most of this research has been done, and as the most wired on the other hand, so Asian people in this case. So people are kind of stereotyped in the way in which they, they uh, you know, are described as using the internet and accessing it. So contrary to common notions about the digital divide, in fact, since the arrival of mobile technology in particular, its uptake has actually been enormous among racialized people in general and also in the global south. So there are figures that I don't have um, at the moment, but there's simply a huge amount of mobile phone use in, um, in countries of the global south, uh, for example. But we do have some uh, data from the United States, so for example, and this is about social media, there are an estimated 48% of online American, African Americans using Instagram and 67% of them using Facebook. So this is contrary to the idea that they were shut out of the internet or not interested or unable to access for a variety of reasons. And culturally speaking, black people, African Americans in particular, have been especially influential on various platforms, for example, Twitter, um, not just due to Black Lives Matter, which I'm going to talk about a bit later on, but also in terms of inspiring a huge range of social trends. Sanjay Sharma, uh, the British sociologist, has done research on what he calls black tags, or what are known as black tags, which have been particularly influential on so-called black Twitter. So tags that you may have come across if you're interested in this kind of stuff um, include things like uh, hashtag black girl magic, hashtag Oscar so white, you may remember that, the criticism of the Oscar ceremony um, you know, mainly, Oscar's mainly going to white films, hashtag carefree black girl and hashtag growing up black are just some examples of Twitter uh, hashtags that have been uh, very influential. But according to Sanjay Sharma, despite their influence, black Twitter and so-called black tags have been completely unstudied, generally not, an, not of interest to, um, you know, cultural theorists and sociologists. It's assumed to be only about identity, but according to Sharma, black tags are what he calls racialized digital objects, and we need to analyze them as such. Trending algorithms play a critical role in the emergence and circulation of black tags, and he says, and this is Sanjay Sharma says, they have an, a, the ability to interrupt the whiteness of, of a social media platform like Twitter, okay, by creating separate spaces, but which are also highly influential on certain trends. Black tags connote black vernacular expressions, so ways of talking, um, often humorous, or for example, certain types of social commentary like Oscar's So White, right? So starts off with somebody noticing and you know, creates a hashtag, and then this unleashes an enormous amount of, of discussion that then seeps into mainstream media because it becomes influential on social media and then has an impact on how the mainstream discusses it. And these black tags often center around critique, obviously, of racism um, uh, in particular. 
They are addressed, importantly, by black people to black people, but they also become trending topics. So that's what I mean by separate spheres being created, but also having influence. But the virality of certain topics or tags may not necessarily reveal the identity of users. This opens up an interesting discussion about the influence of black Twitter uh, users on the social media landscape in general, beyond their actual numbers in the population or online. In other words, other people who are not necessarily directly concerned by the topics of the tags start to use them because they have become so influential. Now, the spread of GIFs is another example um, that's been associated with their production and spread by black people in the United States. Although GIFs have also more recently become a mainstay of the far right, for example, so the far right online uses a huge amount of GIFs, um, they were first produced by black Twitter and Tumblr users and later, due to their importance, made into built-in features of Facebook and Twitter. So those of you who use those platforms will know that you can choose to communicate with a pre-formatted GIF that you can pop into your message. Here, political scientist Charlton McElwain talks about GIFs. This is just a few seconds of his, his talking about GIFs. <laughs> So think so about think these, these forms, forms of expression, expression that are also, also not, not just, just kind of, kind of uh, verbal expression, but racialized expression, expression in some way, way. Uh, tied, uh, tied to both to race, race, sometimes, sometimes to gender, and particular, particular ways, ways in which people, which people uh, express, express uh, uh, certain uh, forms of, of contempt, contempt or, or dismissal, dismissal. <laughs> or whatever, or whatever that, that is. is. <laughs> okay. That's quite interesting. Um, there's been a debate about when I was looking into this, I've noticed online that there's been a debate about whether the use of black gifts and also emojis such as these is a sign of racist cultural appropriation. So there's a huge amount of online debate about whether non-black people can use black gifts and black emojis. So maybe that's something to discuss in tutorials. I think it's interesting because it seems to conflict with Sanjay Sharma's idea that the influence of these tags and gifts and cultural modes of production have been so important that they've actually been used much more widely. So maybe despite some people's opposition, it's unstoppable because it's been so important um, culturally. Now, I've mentioned Charlton McElwain. He's an American political scientist who's done a lot of um, work on, on the internet in particular. And he has looked at structural racism and the internet. And he says that the internet is in fact segregated along racial lines despite this idea that I mentioned before that the internet is a race-neutral space or a post-racial environment. Although it is hard to study why this is the case, he says, it's fair to assume that the internet just kind of mirrors our society and that's what he's basically saying in this quote. McElwain's study is focused on the question of whether the online environment systematically produces advantages and disadvantages along racial lines. And his research used a software called Voson. Voson, what it does is it crawls the web uh, to identify what websites uh, the source sites link to and what sites link to the source sites. Don't worry, it's a bit complicated. In other words, it just crawls the web and looks at where, how links are created, so how you go from one website to another website. So when you click through, you click a link and go somewhere else, yeah? So McElwain characterized different websites under two labels. Now, I find his labeling a little strange, but it doesn't matter. We'll stick with his labeling. He says that there are two types, racial sites and non-racial sites. Racial sites were those that explicitly had content for racialized minorities. Now, Remember, this is all in the US context. Again, like 99% of the research on digital technology and the internet is being done in the US, which is problematic in and of itself, I think. But in other words, these sites for racialized minorities mean sites that were specifically produced for use 
for example, by groups such as African American people, Latino people, and so on and so forth. While non-racial sites, on the other hand, didn't have any particular group in mind. So they were just general websites. And he found that people's browsing preferences, which he analyzed by looking at the number of clicks that users made between different types of sites, were towards the non-racial rather than the racial sites. In other words, internet users were avoiding sites in general that had explicitly black or Latino or otherwise racialized, racialized identities. This also has an effect in terms of the placement of different websites by search engines. So when you ask Google for something, right, and you say, I want to know, I don't know, what, where's the best pizza in Vatican, right? So that kind of thing. The so-called racial sites, Charlton McElwyn says, are less visible, they get less traffic, and therefore are likely to reap fewer benefits from visibility. So what are the benefits from being more visible in a Google search? Well, obviously you get more advertising revenue, or you get higher search engine rankings, which translates directly into your profitability as an internet-based company. Now, if you think about this in the so-called analog world, or the you know, in real life world, think about what would, what would our reaction be if people were avoiding certain types of shops or restaurants because, for example, they were being run by particular groups of racialized people, then we would instantly recognize this as being structural racism. And McElwain, McElwain's argument is that the same conclusion can be reached when it comes to internet browsing. So it's as racist to avoid certain sites because of their so-called racialized identity on the internet as it is to do so when it comes to real life. So another person who's written about this is uh, Sophia Noble, and she talks about how in 2015 there was a lot of concern that Google Maps uh, is a racist platform. People were searching for racist terms, and this is in the Obama era, so they were searching for terms such as N-word house, and the Google search brought them to, can you imagine where? This is in the context of Obama's presidency, the search was for N-word house. Where do you think they were being brought to? I'm just seeing if you're awake. Anybody imagine? The White House, exactly. So, but as Lisa Nakamura has argued, it's not so much that Google Maps per se is racist, but that the internet is racist and people online are racist. In other words, if enough people associate words in association with each other in internet searches, in this case N-word plus White House, then Google Maps will learn that. So it's not Google Maps that's racist, it's users who are racist. As Charlton McElwain has said, the web from the very beginning has been a haven for the explicitly racist speech by white supremacists. But it has also become a haven for people who fancy themselves as egalitarian to express the kind of racial resentments, anger and mistrust that they know is not publicly acceptable. In other words, people are saying racist things online that they wouldn't say to your face. Yeah. Now, Sophia Noble is the author of a new book called Algorithms of Oppression, uh, which looks at how search engines reinforce racism. She gives many enlightening examples. So, for example, she says if you type black girls, so the two words black girls, into Google US, yeah, this is not necessarily the case in Australia, as I'll say in a minute, what you get are a huge amount of pornographic terms, websites, and images. Now this seems to be less the case in Australia, showing, that how, showing how racism on the internet is also society specific. So you might get a completely different connotation of black, but that would change if you used Aboriginal, which I'll talk about in a minute. In Noble's book, she challenges the idea that search engines like Google offer an equal playing field for all forms of ideas, uh, identities and activities, she says that data discrimination, in fact, is a real social problem. And she argues that the combination of private interest in promoting certain sites, along with the monopoly status of a relatively small number of internet search engines, so the fact that Google, for example, dominates the landscape and you don't really have much look-in 
if you're not Google, leads to a biased set of search algorithms that privilege whiteness and discriminate against people of color. So this is linked to what Charlton McElwain was saying about what you get when you type certain things into Google. Now there's um, a video uh, of her speaking, which unfortunately I don't have time to show you, um, but for example, she talks about what you get in an internet search if you type in Mike Brown. And Mike Brown was the young man who was shot dead by police in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. And you get all kinds of associations with his name, which is not so much about the tragedy of the fact that he was being killed, but really kind of re replicating the racist ideas about him. So this idea that he was a thug or that he was carrying a gun when he wasn't, and all those ideas that the police tried to put out rather than what was actually the case. Now, as I said, while Google Australia may not bring up the same results, um, for example, uh, Noble, the one she cites is black on white crime. Um, you, she says that you, you get, and um, this is in the video, which I don't have time to show, but perhaps um, you can watch later or put it on views. You get particular kinds of answers from US Google. But if you do something else, which is what I did, and I put in Aboriginal and violence, so those two different words, these are the results that you get. These are the first top results that you get um, in uh, Australian Google. So rather than focusing on you know, the violence experienced by Aboriginal people historically and today, so you know, if I was to think about Aboriginality and violence, I would think about the violence of you know, settlement of Australia, invasion and so on, but actually what you get is, well, how violent are Aboriginal people? Another area of interest is the way in which algorithms that drive face recognition software, which is increasingly used, used in a wide variety of contexts, especially policing, displays racist or racial bias. The software is, in fact, less able to recognize particular faces. So, for example, in the case of people with black African features, as this image shows, actually you can't see it very clearly, I'll just dim the lights. So this is um, somebody's iPhone, <laughs> didn't pick him up, but picked up the image on his t-shirt, right? So it couldn't recognize his face. Um, the algorithms are based in, on data that is collected from police surveillance cameras that are trained constantly on our faces. In Los Angeles, for example, the faces that these cameras collect are then compared in real time against so-called hot lists of people who are suspected of gang activity or having an open arrest warrant. Facial recognition systems are more likely either to misidentify or to fail to identify American, African Americans than other uh, people from other racialized groups. And these errors could result in innocent citizens being marked as suspects in crimes. Now, this is not particular to the LAPD. In fact, data collected on facial recognition software in the US reveals a pattern of racial bias. The accuracy of the software appears also to be based on where it is produced. So software produced in East Asian countries, for example, is better at recognizing Chinese, Japanese, and Korean faces, for example while the software that is created in Europe or North America is better at uh, recognizing white faces. Now, this is obviously intensely problematic in a multicultural setting, uh, and one in which, such as Australia or the US or many countries in Europe, where there has been for a long time disproportionate targeting of racialized minorities in policing and the criminal justice system. Because of the potential of this software to add further to racial bias and related discrimination, um, it's interesting that a group was set up in the US, they call themselves the Algorithmic Justice League, um, and it's a collective that has, its aims are to highlight bias in algorithms, provide spaces for people to voice concern and experiences with coded bias, and to, to develop practices for accountability during the design, development, and deployment of coded systems. OK, if you allow me to go on for a little while, then I'm going to move on to a different topic.
which is the way in which um, you know the internet has really facilitated the spread of far right extremist ideas. Now, Sophia Noble, in the video that I had wanted to show you, but some of you may have watched it online, she explains how um, Dylan Roof, who I think I've mentioned before, he uh, is the, the the person who uh, massacred churchgoers in Alabama in 2015. Um, he created this kind of online manifesto, where he kind of had two manifestos that kind of were supposed to explain why he did this. And it shows, what this shows is that there's a huge amount of information, if you can call it that, uh, online where far-right extremists can gather ideas that ultimately serve as rationales for their hatred and ultimately their attacks. But far-right extremists are also using the internet and social media to organize online. This is perhaps where it's even more scary. In fact, they've been among the first to take up the internet and social media. So Jesse Daniels, for example, in her book Cyber Racism, showed how many of the white supremacist groups who she researched for her first book, White Lies, which was a book about you know, groups organizing in the pre-internet age, how they made a really successful transition to the internet. So they were first uptakers of the internet. Far-right racist hate speech is really difficult to legislate against, especially because in the USA, it is protected under the First Amendment. So for example, when I was targeted for an article that I'd written uh, by the Australian far right, it's a group called, um, they call themselves uh, Stormfront Down Under, it's like a, a far right website. I couldn't be protected when I went to the Australian Human Rights Commission and asked them to, to address this, because actually that website is registered in the US. So basically Australian racists can sit around online here and say anything that they want and be protected under the First Amendment in the USA. In fact, Stormfront in the US, where it began, was among the first to use the internet as a means to chat online as early as the 1980s. Yeah? It set up its website in 1995, and Don Black, the former Ku Klux Klan leader who ran the site, said that it was to, and I quote, provide an alternative news media and create a virtual community for the fragmented white nationalist movement. Now, after the protests at the University of Virginia at Charlottesville in August, during which an anti-fascist protester, Heather Hare, was killed by a white supremacist, efforts have been made to make it more difficult for the so-called alt-right uh, to organize online. So, for example, the web services company GoDaddy shut down the Daily Stormer website. So the Daily Stormer was one of those big websites that, around which the alt-right activists were kind of coalescing and organizing. The Daily Stormer website was described as the preeminent online cheerleader of far-right extremism in the US in the past three to four years. So it's actually a pretty big deal that, um, you know, that they were no longer uh, allowed to operate online. But of course, very quickly, they have transitioned into other sites. In fact, I heard that there's a, they have a special social media networking site called, I think, GAD or something which is just huge, has huge amounts of people using it. So in an article on extremism on the World Wide Web, Chris Hale notes that the existence of the internet has been very important to the spread of far right wing uh, ideas, especially during the Obama era. And he quotes the Simon Wiesenthal Center, which said in 2011 that there were 14,000 social networking sites, forums, Twitter, blogs, news groups, and other on-demand video sites supporting just hate-motivated extremist groups alone. And we can imagine that this has gone up exponentially in the last six years. According to Hale, white power groups online, such as the Ku Klux Klan, the Aryan skinheads, neo-Nazis, and Christian identity groups, push a victimization discourse online. The main concern that they promote is that whites in North America, Europe, and Australia are becoming a minority, and that whites have to organize to fight back against this or risk losing their power to black people and migrants. This has become known as white genocide. Some of you may have heard um, this term being used. 
This poster, for example, was found in Brisbane, disseminated by a group which calls itself the Dingoes. A website called the White Genocide Project fuels this narrative online. And it argues that white, uh, that white people in Eastern countries, sorry, this is wrong. Uh, it, it argues that people, while people in Western countries are the only people who are forced to accept multiculturalism, and other people are allowed to live with their own people, so-called. And that's why it uses slogans such as what you can see on the poster here, things like Asia for the Asians, Africa for the Africans, white countries for everybody. So this idea that white countries are the only ones who have been inflicted, or so-called white countries, the only ones to have been inflicted with multiculturalism through immigration. This allows them to, be, uh, to avoid being labeled racist, because they argue, so these white power activists argue, that it's not that they want to annihilate people of color or cause them any harm, rather they say that every group has its so-called natural home and that it is wrong to allow race mixing to occur through immigration and multiculturalism. However, of course, it is this very thinking that has led to racist murders on a mass scale. So, for example, Dylan Roof, who I've mentioned before, but also the Norwegian mass murderer Anders Bering Breivik, who massacred 72 people in 2011 because he was opposed to multiculturalism in Norway. And he cited, and as did in Roof, cited white genocide as a major motivating factor. In Australia, the far right often spreads its message by using the idea of patriotism, but as Michael Brell uh, points out in an article in New Matilda, um, not but, but as he points out in his article, most videos made by far-right groups start out with the, you know, with greeting, good day, patriots. So this notion that we're not racist, we're just being patriotic. And I think it's quite worrying because hiding behind a discourse of patriotism and claiming not to be racist but merely concerned citizens who are concerned about issues such as Muslim radicalization, or the falling fertility rate among whites has allowed some of these groups to gain acceptance in the mainstream. So for example, the leader of the United Patriots Front, which is one of these far right wing extremist groups, is a guy called Blair Cottrell, was recently invited onto Hack Live, a TV show. Um, the show chose to invite him to speak or to be a guest after an essential media poll showed that 49% of Australians would support a ban on Muslim immigration. So the UPF, the United Patriots Front, are obviously a virulently anti-Muslim group. So the fact that the mainstream media saw fit to invite Petrel to discuss Muslim immigration is, I think, testimony to the mainstream, mainstreaming, sorry, of their ideas, and I think the internet has been key to this. So this kind of shift from the fringes of the internet into the very heart of mainstream media. And you might argue that this is sensationalism, but obviously um, it poses uh, quite a few problems. Now, if you bear with me, I just want to make a couple more comments. It's about seven minutes too. And again, shift to a slightly different topic. Some of you may have heard about the Microsoft artificial intelligence chatterbot called Tay. Anybody heard of this particular incident? Okay, so a few years ago, this chatterbot that it created, so Microsoft created this bot that would be on Twitter, right? And very quickly, Tay, this AI chatterbot, was taught to be racist when it started interacting on Twitter. And it's an example of how far online extremist views have spread online. I'll briefly show you this short video. Parents, Parents do not know that AI chat on Twitter. 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 It only it ends in disaster. disaster. I'm Bridget Carey. This is your, your CNET, CNET update. update. So in the last, the last CNET, CNET update, update show, I reported on a new artificially, artificially intelligent creation, creation from Microsoft, from Microsoft a, chat a chat bot named Tay. Tay. She, was, she designed was designed to speak like a teenager, like a teenager and learn from how other young adults, adults talk by interacting, by interacting online. online. But in a but matter in of hours, hours Tay, went Tay went from a from sweet and sassy, and sassy online team full of memes and emoji dreams, dreams and was and corrupted, corrupted into a Hitler-supporting Hitler sex, sex bot. bot. 
Twitter users trolled her by sending her racist and misogynistic comments with foul language, and they also fed her plenty of political propaganda about presidential candidates Ted Cruz and Donald Trump. So in her learning process, she quickly started spewing it all back out. Microsoft turned off the chatbot and deleted offensive posts, and they're now making adjustments. If only it were that easy to adjust the rest of humanity online. If it took less than a day for a computer AI to learn this is how we talk, we should not be letting computers learn from the internet. Or what if someday an alien race observes us by looking at our online conversations? Yeah, Twitter's going to be the reason our planet's blown up. Okay. So although, as she said, Microsoft quickly took Tay down, the possibility for racism in artificial intelligence is endless particularly given the spread of the so-called Internet of Things. So this is digital software that's built into everyday objects, which will become, of course, more and more used in the future. So you would have already heard, of course, of smart cars, smart homes, um, the use of this technology in security systems, facial recognition software that I've mentioned before. So, for example, this new iPhone that's going to come out with the facial recognition thing, yeah? So, for example, in 2016, a hacker called Andrew Weave Arnheimer, programmed printers in campuses all over the United States to print out racist pamphlets remotely, yeah? And these had racist, anti-Semitic, and anti-immigrant messages on them. In all of these cases, the printers had port 9100 exposed and turned up in searches using MassCan, which is a mass IP port scanner, and all it took was five lines of code in order to take them over. Okay, so I can see that the next class is about to start. What I will do is, due to our late start, I'll, there's a few more slides left. I'll record them uh, later on, and I'll put them online for you. Okay, sorry about that delay today. Thank you.